welcome to Sports Management Podcast, where you will hear interesting sports management professionals share their stories, experiences, and passion for the sports management industry. I am your host, Marcus Philipsson. Welcome to episode 165 of Sports Management Podcast. Today's guest is Kiel Blake, Vice President of Partnerships at Vivenu, a global primary ticketing and experience tech company. He's also an adjunct professor, podcaster, pickleball fanatic, and more. We spoke about the future of ticketing, his work at Vivenu, why he started Sports Media and Tech Podcast, his passion for pickleball, and much more. Keel Blake, welcome to Sports Management Podcast. Thank you, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to have you on the show. You are the VP of Partnerships at Vivenu, a global primary ticketing and experience tech company. So can you tell us a little bit about the company and your role? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. So Vivenu started about six years ago, uh, and it was really with the intention of helping empower organizers to make the most of their ticketing. Three co-founders uh, based out of Germany actually started this company out of school. Uh, it was to bring uh, back more empowerment and control into the hands of the organizers. So we help uh, organizers control their data, control their brand, uh, and also just control the entire experience end to end. Uh, and then, as you could imagine, uh, you know, there's so many other ticketing companies out there today, and, and there's some very big ones that we all don't know the names of that have been in the news recently. And so the venue set out to have an open API to give control also in terms of the partners that they connect. And so uh, the venue is on a very fast growth trajectory. Uh, we have now more than 700 uh, customers globally. Uh, when I started, we had just around 35, uh, maybe 40 team members. We have more than 115 today, and we'll have 200 by the end of the year. And we're just on a mission to uh, really center ticketing around the brand, uh, around the sales experience and really for the folks that operate the content and the venues of the business. Interesting. And that speaks to the growth because you have been with the company for a little over a year only, right? So still to have this growth so fast. Uh, yes, we are growing very quickly uh, and it, it has been. So I've been here just about 18 months. And during that time, I've seen explosive growth, especially uh, in the US and North America. Uh, we've been growing uh, at a very healthy and steady rate in the DAC region and in Europe and in other continents. Uh, but the U.S., since I've been here, we started there, I think, about two and a half years ago now, maybe, maybe just under three, uh, but about two and a half years. And since then, we've had about 250 customers uh, in the U.S. Wow, that's impressive. I assume that you have like events, you know, there might be musical events and sporting events, but since this is the sports management podcast, how much, you know, are you working within the sports industry and how can that look like? Yeah, Marcus, and I'll tell you, when I said that we're working with more than 250 customers in the US, two kids walked by and they were just as excited. So <laughs> but with that said, um, yeah, so working, um, it, you know, globally, we're working with sports and entertainment customers. The unique thing about the venue is that uh, we're really agnostic to the types of events that we can power through our software. So we bring it all in and roll it all into one dashboard and one platform. And what I mean by that is in the sports and entertainment world, you have different ticketing companies that serve different verticals and, and niches based on what their events operate like. And uh, the example would be they're just general admission events that could be uh, you know, uh, a music act out in an outdoor venue uh, that you just show up and there's no seating. You, you bring, you know, a blanket. And a, uh, it's more of like a, an open seating experience. Then you have others that are seated events and venues that we're all very familiar with, maybe going to a basketball game or or um, a theater event. And then you have attractions that may have timed entry slots and and and, and uh, specific windows, uh, whether it's morning, afternoon, or even by 20 minute intervals. Um, and I'm giving a very high level of synopsis there, but there's everything in between. And even a seated event between a basketball game and a, a performing arts event, a, a, you know, a theater are very different in how they operate ticketing. And so with that said, we set out to build the core ticketing engine that people can build it on top of, but we have a very robust set of features to serve each one of these verticals. But we work with partners in those verticals 
to dive even deeper with those customers. Ticketing, obviously, it's an important uh, piece of uh, of live events and sports. And you know, you can talk about dynamic pricing or what price should you have and what type of strategy. So, how have you seen uh, the ticket industry evolving, and what are some trends and important factors right now? I believe the ticketing industry is evolving in so many ways right now, and that includes looking at how to improve the experience, how to look at purchasing trends to fill the venue or fill the the experience as much as possible, but then also looking at how to make the most revenue based on the supply and demand of ticketing. But then I also see some shifts happening in terms of who really controls that experience and being able to bring that in-house because technology has evolved so much that ticketing used to be something where you had to go to uh, one of maybe a handful of players to to be able to sell tickets through and be able to get help for marketing, et cetera. Whereas technology has evolved so much that it's also evolving and disrupting ticketing in a sense because it's empowering organizers to do a lot of these things historically they leaned on others for, but to do them themselves. And so that's really where I see a lot of the innovation happening is that people that are running events and running venues are wanting to create digital ecosystems, and then platforms that help with their internal operations to improve the experience of, I mean, the the first point of contact is going to buy a ticket, of course, to go to an event, but then to improve that experience all the way through frictionless entry of getting to the event, getting in, the communication before you go to the event and what you need to know. Once you're at the event, where do you need to go to get to your seat? what amenities, what food and beverage uh, is going to be available then to uh, surveys and communicating how did the event go and and retaining those fans, attendees, customers to come back for future events. And all of that, even though that doesn't sound like it's part of ticketing, it all starts with the ticket and because the ticket is the initial relationship. And then it's stewarding that relationship through the rest of the journey being, whether it be someone coming for one event or someone coming to become a, say, in a sporting event, a season ticket holder for a lifetime. Hmm. I mean, it's important that this whole process is seamless, right? Because people are used to now with technology that things are easy and seamless, so you don't want any hiccups. If it's difficult, you might go somewhere else to purchase this ticket if they find it not too user-friendly and so forth. So uh, I assume that that's something as well with the user-friendliness and the seamless process. That's something that you have taken in mind. Marcus, that's a great point. I think uh, we're in... Uh, era of patience is so important as a, as a principle of being a human being. However, from a consumer standpoint, our patience uh, is much less than it's ever been because we're so used to things becoming easier and easier. And so if something is taking, because at the end of the day, what is our most precious asset in life? It's time. And so if, if an apple to an apple, one apple takes much less time to get than the other, we're just trained as, as human beings to go after the, if it's an apple to an apple, the apple that takes less time because time is our, our most valuable asset. So that's something from a user experience side, we're always looking at is how many clicks, how many, how, how fast can someone get through a conversion? And we have a lot of mechanisms uh, to help create extremely quick conversions. Uh, we see a lot of increases bringing customers over um, from their conversion rate, but going back high level, just to technology and innovation and ticketing, Technology is rapidly changing faster than it ever has before. And that may sound cliche, but with AI and and, and the continuous developments that that is going to continue to push and just uh, the innovation that that humans are driving in so many other areas too, we empower through our open APIs the ability to connect into the latest and greatest technology. And and we uh, really embrace the idea that we're going to be the best ticketing platform but we're, we have these open APIs to partner and connect seamlessly with all these other best-in-class technologies that are going to rapidly change over the next year, five years, 10 years, and then into the next decades. Yeah, I like that with the open API. I think it's uh, it's great. So you mentioned AI as well. Are you leveraging AI in your business in any way? So as of today, in our core platform, we're not leveraging AI as of today. However, many of our partners that we're connected into and integrated into are leveraging AI. And that's, I think, a little bit of our approach that's unique in that sense. You can look at, say, Amazon 
uh, as a marketplace, right? Where people go to buy all different types of, of goods and um, whether it's retail, whether it's groceries, uh, et cetera. Where we come into the industry from a ticketing standpoint is like how Shopify came into the online space. We're coming in and empowering organizers, but where Shopify um, and our organization are very aligned is a sense of opening up a partnership marketplace to empower these partners to come in with the latest and greatest technology. Now, I say that today, I, I do foresee us using AI in the future, but it's not just been one of our co core focuses because we're empowering the latest and greatest partners to come in um, around our, our tech to serve our customers. What are some strategy when it comes to ticket pricing and because maybe someone wants to fill the stadium someone wants to maximize uh, revenue someone you don't want to piss off the season ticket holder by too low pricing so how are you thinking around this uh, strategically yeah so we're positioned to be advocates for our customers right and and part of that is our open marketplace of partnerships because we're not forcing our customers to work with one partner or the other or saying, here's the only way you can do dynamic pricing. Here's the only way that you can, uh, you know, work with the secondary market, or here's the only way that you can have a CRM, et cetera. Uh, we have multiple options. So we position ourselves as advocates and almost as internal consultants with our customers that are, uh, we have experts from the ticketing industry that uh, we brought on board and continue to bring on board um, as we're growing. Uh, but diving in deeper on dynamic pricing. So from a, a strategy perspective, put it this way, force is a lot further ahead or attractions are a lot further ahead than some other verticals uh, in the entertainment space on leveraging dynamic pricing. So what we're doing is coming in and bringing best practices and sharing them across our customers on say, looking at forecasting, looking at weather, looking at you know, buying trends across anonymously across the platform, um, but then also working with our partners to dive in because our partners have access to other data that uh, we don't. And that's one of the things that I do have to touch on just as a, a little side note, is that we empower our customers to own their own data so they know we're not sharing their customers with our other customers. And so another element of that is anything that we're doing to learn and pull in insights, it's going to be anonymous, but against verticals, categories, event types, et cetera. But that's where we can come in and work with our partners and work with our customers to look at pricing strategies, whether it be say a sports team or an attraction to find the, the, the right mix where uh, based on the supply and based on the demand at the time is also going to uh, match with, like you said, not upsetting the season ticket holder so that they can increase their revenues over time by leveraging our dynamic pricing API and changing those prices in real time. And that's what's giving us the opportunity to work with, say, leagues, to be able to pool the data of teams that we're working with, to help them with strategies over time as well, to learn what works really well and what does not work so well, because it's just like A-B testing in the app, right? It's that you're going to see over time what trends are successful and what trends lead towards um, a better experience for the fans. This is so fascinating to me, how much like goes into this whole machinery, that it's not just that a price is set on X uh, dollars and then maybe the closer to the event, the higher the price. But you said like you take in weather, you take in what, what type of event it is and uh, all the other factors that the stakes, the rights holders want. And uh, it's uh, a lot that goes into it, really. And it's really an exciting time because I have to give a shout out to one of our newest partners, Logitix. We just completed an integration uh, that empowers uh, our customers to send tickets directly into the secondary market, but it also empowers them to work with the data and work with the expertise that the Logitix team has on pricing across the market, not only in the primary and the secondary. So now you're talking about whether you're talking about all the, the factors we just discussed, plus the primary and secondary pricing. But we're doing that from the perspective of the individual organizer and letting them serve with the best interest of their attendees in mind, not necessarily working across multiple venues, et cetera. It's for that individual organizer because at the end of the day, they want to build a great relationship with their attendee and with their family. Yeah. 
no, Logitech has uh, had one of their representatives on the podcast as well. So uh, it's uh, tying everything together here. Like yes. It. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you mentioned that, uh, of course, the, the industry has come a long way in a very short time. Also, Vivenu has you know increased a lot. We talked about that. But uh, looking into the future with everything that goes on with technology, AI, everything, what is your vision for the future of ticketing and for Vivenu? So I'll go back to a topic I mentioned, but didn't discuss in detail. It's, it's frictionless experiences. I believe that we're moving into a future where there's omni-channel sales efforts delivered by AI, powered by personal assistance. So we all have our phone and that becomes an omni-channel device where I can just say, hey, and I got to be careful what I say, otherwise you start talking to me, but hey, so-and-so, I'd love to go to an event this weekend. What do you think? And, and my fiance's name is Kelsey. So it's like, what do you think is going on in the area that Kelsey and I would really enjoy? Oh, or do you want to go to music, sports, or you know, a, a cultural event locally, or a theater performance? Uh, let's go to a sports event. Oh, there's an FC Cincinnati game this weekend, and there's a Reds game. Which of the two? Okay, let's go to um, the Reds game. Would you like to uh, um, go to, for a VIP experience, or would you like for the you know the best rate? Uh, let let you know we 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 love sport events, but to travel or pickleball, etc. We don't go to events all the time, so let's go for the VIP experience. Okay, would you like to sit in the club, or you get and it's just it's all in real time, and 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 it's all driven through AI. But now. That's going to empower me to buy the tickets just by a conversation. And then now I'm going to get the ticket delivered. It's going to be in my wallet on my phone digitally. Now I'm going to get a notification to um, take a photo or, or give permission to the, you know, the software that I've already matched my ID with so that my face is recognizable. And then I'm going to go to the venue with Kelsey and it's going to see our faces and we don't have to show tickets. We just walk in through this open gate. And when we walk in, my phone says, Hey, welcome to the Reds game. Uh, by the way, here's uh, how you get to your seat. And all of a sudden, a I'm using AR on my phone because you know I, I'm too cheap to buy my meta glasses yet. But with that said, I'm using AI on my phone and I'm just walking to um, uh, my seats. Right. So I, I get to my seats and all of a sudden I say, Hey, are you hungry? And then I order some food and I get a big, you know, thing of water because I'm trying to stay healthy and and, and, and just, I want to, but then all of a sudden, you know, we're in the third inning and now I got to go to the bathroom and I got to go really bad. So then I go to my phone and say, Hey, where's the nearest bathroom that has the least wait time? Well, there's technology that's using AI to monitor lines outside of, of bathrooms. And now I get to, Oh, if you go here you can get there the quickest and go to the bathroom. So end-to-end -end frictionless experiences. And then on the way home, hey, remember, here's where you parked your car, and this is the best route to get home. And by the way, uh, we got some great seats that are available three weeks from now. Would you like to come back? And it's just, I could go on and on about all these different areas, but I just feel that AI will continue to drive through all of these partners and, and through all of these different aspects of the experience, ways to easily connect and then take that experience home because now then um, the Reds are going to send me an uh, opportunity to, to get VR, AR streaming with them to then put on my device at home and then sit back in the seats I was in or be right behind or sitting in the dugout um, enjoying the game. And that's not too far away. We're, we're, we're in a world where all of this is very realistic um, in the next couple of decades. Yeah. No, that's crazy to think about, right? Because if we said this 10 years ago, it would uh, we would think that would be 100 years in the future, maybe. And now it, it's here. Yeah. And, and all of that <laughs> starts with the ticket, <laughs> whether whether it's a physical ticket, a digital ticket. And that's the other thing. You know, I might get an offer to get a really cool printed ticket, like a ticket time machine, right? Uh, a company or a WWE that, that sends a commemorative ticket now it's not scanning but it's still something now that's a keepsake that i take and i got signed and i then framed because there's still value right in those digital assets or it's a blockchain um you know crypto type uh nft that uh um, is a digital asset that i can keep that has an audio um almost like an audio signature from a player <laughs> you know who knows what the future will bring 
Yeah, exactly. No, because the collectible one, as you said, like many people have collected tickets and that's an important piece of the game, obviously, or the event that you go to. So uh, to find a, a digital version of that as well. Yeah, and then uh, Keel and Kelsey, that's, uh, it goes well. You have similar, similar <laughs> names there, right? Thank you, Marcus. We, 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 we seem to think so too. We got engaged about two and a half weeks ago. So very, very, uh, very, very good time of life. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm interested in how your career has been, you know, up until uh, you have you have worked in the ticketing space. I know that uh, you're also an adjunct professor, but what did you study in school? How did you get into sports and uh, wor work ourselves up to where we are now? Yeah, thank you, Marcus. So I, I got my start uh, at UCF, University of Central Florida in Orlando, uh, Orlando, Florida. Uh, I studied finance and sports business management. And I really thought that I was going to go into a career into the financial industry. I'll give this one little side plug. I, I actually started as a film major uh, and then there was the economic crash. And I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to need to make a little bit of money when I get out of college uh, to pay for my degree. Uh, and so I changed to a finance and then, you know, I met a few mentors during my journey and a couple of those mentors, uh, I'll give them a shout out, were uh, Dr. Keith Harrison, were a professor of Scott Buckstein, uh, and then also uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Sutton, and, uh, and then Richard Lapchick as well, Dr. Richard Lapchick. And so the four of them were all at UCF, and uh, they inspired me uh, to pursue a career in sports business. I, I still didn't believe it. I, I kept taking out internships in the finance industry. Uh, and then uh, I took an internship and got very lucky. He was offered a position at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Uh, and I was working for uh, their, their chief business officer uh, who became their tournament director over time, uh, Marcy Doyle. And she just opened up an opportunity for me to assist their team, which was small, believe it or not, a PGA Tour event, probably seven, eight person team with 1500 volunteers. And so I got to help um, at all different facets from the ticketing office to the inside the ropes experience to the expo, working right alongside them with all the decision makers. Again, not making the decision, but helping alongside all of the uh, different aspects of the event. And that opened my eyes of how big of a world uh, sports business is. Um, and then also during my time at UCF, Michael Jordan's sons, Marcus and Jeff, were on the basketball team. And I had been a practice player with the women's basketball team and played with the men's teams over the summer. And, you know, I just got to see a microcosm of the sports industry from a high level professional perspective, a brand perspective, and then um, see UCF grow over time. And that really inspired me to want to work in sports. So I share that to say is because I, I got my start actually working at UCF Athletics. Uh, and I started in the fundraising department and then went into marketing. And it was during a time of explosive growth. And we went from having two, 3,000 people on a Facebook page and my role turned into quickly leading digital marketing at UCF Athletics. And uh, we went from two to 3,000 people on a Facebook page to almost 100,000 in one season and went from, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of engagements impressions to 40 million engagements with 12 million unique people the next season and built a, a digital asset that was worth a lot of money. And it wasn't about driving just the revenue. It was more about driving the relationship with our community that was so young because it was a young school. So I got to just have a, a sandbox and some really great mentors like Zach Lasseter, who's the AD now at uh, Ubbling Christian University, that opened this opportunity up to play in this space that was growing and got to learn a lot about different um, fan segmentations, uh, you know, what really drives behavior and, and drives fans to engage with content, engage with the relationship they have with a, with a sports brand or an entertainment brand. Um, and then that opened the door to working for an insurance agency, overseeing their marketing. They had 30 plus sports team partnerships, Insurance Office America. And then I got inspired by their leaders, um, John Rittenauer, Heath Rittenauer, uh, my boss, John Thurman, uh, to start my own company. And then two of my customers I worked uh, for then in a full-time capacity after at Thumbprint. And then that uh, uh, Thumbprint was a marketing technology firm. We're doing Hertz, Hilton, Wyndham. And I share all these experiences and just learned so much. And that's what I want to emphasize is that having a curiosity is so important. And I say this because during my time at Thumbprint, I started teaching. And that's really a big passion of mine is paying it forward to, to students and young professionals. And I, I always talk about it's so important to have that curiosity to, to learn and, and, and continue to sharpen your skills. Uh, and then during my time at Thumbprint, 
Ticket Socket was growing, and they were a customer of mine uh, at uh, my marketing agency. And uh, they made an offer, and that turned into an opportunity to travel the world and help build the business over the course of a uh, wild time because we went into nine months of explosive growth. And then all of a sudden, one of our customers called us in Korea uh, and said, hey, we're going to have to shut down for three months. And I, I say that to share because that was January, uh, I believe 2020 of the pandemic, right? And so all of a sudden, three months later, you know, it started moving towards the US. And that was one of the most obviously wild times in the world. But from a live events in a, in, in a sports and entertainment space, we know what happened. Uh, you know, from a perspective, everything had to shut down. So uh, we learned so much. We invested in ourselves, invested into the product and and, and worked together through a, a, a wild time. Uh, but I was with Ticket Socket for quite some time. And then I found, um, and I would say the two leaders, two of the three leaders uh, we met at Intix at the venue. And I was so impressed by the product. And, and that's how I found myself here. And it's been an exciting journey to be able to learn through that whole process. Wow, quite the journey. I love it. And as you said, with the curiosity, uh, you can see that through the daring to start your own your own company and taking, call it risks and, you know, trying new things and being in, in marketing, being in ticketing, being having your own company, working in sports with the finance. So uh, it's done you good, it looks like. I've been very lucky to have that curiosity and work hard around people who also have that drive to go and build things. Um, and, and, and that's where uh, it's been uh, an incredible journey to see the growth of Ticket Socket and also now see this explosive growth that I've, you know we've never seen before in the industry with the venue of raising 65 million in, in uh, capital, uh, and then also growing in the last six years at a speed that this industry has never seen with the size of customers uh, that we're currently working with. Yeah, that is great to see. And especially, as you mentioned, after COVID, that uh, it, of course, took a big hit in the sporting industry in general. So to see now, you know, how it's uh, bounced back and uh, shines. Absolutely. During that time, it was uh, an opportunity to take a step back and really work on the product and really work on the experience. And then Believe it or not, it was a time where you could go out and meet with so many folks that were in the industry because the live events weren't happening. So not that people weren't busy, but at the same time, it was a different busy because they were able to focus in on their own experience. So they were more open to actually taking calls to learn about what was new. And the pandemic for a lot of industries actually created so much innovation and disruption because people had to find ways because revenue was pinched to cut costs and then to be able to increase revenue as we as we start to you know sort of returning back to more normal operation after and it also speaks to the you need to be you be agile and to react to when something happens like this and that the companies that have survived and that excels that uh, they did that they they took a step back and they reevaluated and they made the best out of a bad situation yeah yeah and i don't want to make simpler light of anyone's hard challenges during the pandemic because it was so hard for so many different people and industries. Uh, but it is important uh, to be able to adapt uh, and, and adopt new things. Uh, and then also it's important to be resilient. And, and that's where I feel that uh, companies and people uh, that really dug in were able to find ways to innovate during that time and, and drive change that is long lasting now. Definitely. So on this topic, you mentioned uh, curiosity, but uh, if you would like to give some advice to someone who works or want to work in the sports industry, what would that be? Great question, Marcus. So I would lean in on that curiosity of building connections with people to really learn more about yourself and how you can improve your own skill sets to bring value to the sports and entertainment space. And I, I really do believe we're in a time where what that value looks like is shifting. Technology is being introduced at a faster rate than ever. Uh, and so the point being is that it's, it's if you wanna work in the sports space, it's finding, you know, Wayne Gretzky, right? You work with Bauer. So I, we'll, we'll talk about hockey here for a second, but you gotta skate to where the pucks go. And, and that's where I really believe that the skill sets that are needed in the space are different than they've ever been before. Uh, and so if you can lean in 
on understanding data, understanding analytics, understanding computer technology, understanding AI. It doesn't mean you have to be a developer. It doesn't mean, but you do have to be open to learning and understanding how to apply these great technologies that are coming out to the traditional sports experience, theater experience, entertainment experience, attraction experience in a way that's going to improve that experience, increase revenue, uh, or uh, cut costs or improve operational efficiencies. Um, and so the more you can be curious and learn and, 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 uh, and bring those skill sets, I think there's just limitless opportunities. I agree. And your curiosity has taken you to Vivenu, but also you mentioned the film that you did that in school. I didn't, I didn't ask about that, but is that some uh, a passion of yours? Was it filmmaking or? Yeah. What, what so, was... so I, I really, when I was young, I loved making films and not, not to be on, you know, necessarily the other side of the camera and some I was, but that's not, my passion was to direct and was to storytell. Um, and that's, I think it's been prevalent throughout my, my uh, career as well as I've spent a lot of time in marketing roles and in building brands. And I, I really believe that every organization and every person has, has a story to tell. Uh, and I think it's so important to learn how to tell that story, uh, to engage and connect with others, and then also to ask questions and, and, and listen and learn. Definitely. And uh, on that topic as well, you, just like myself, also has a podcast that you started during COVID sports media and tech podcast so uh, how did you decide or why did you decide to start it and how did it come about so at the time i was teaching at ucf i was teaching sport media and tech and we went from being in person in class to being remote and what we typically would do is i would teach on a wheel of a curriculum that talked about all of and, and, and dove deep in each class for three hours into different uh, technology areas and where the, the industry was headed. So whether it was AI, whether it was streaming, whether it was you know OTTs and streaming, whether it was uh, the, the ticketing as a primary and secondary markets. And, but of course, no single person can be an expert in each of these areas. So I would share with my students, I'm more of a tour guide, but I'm going to bring in these experts to talk with you in each of these topics. And so uh, each class would bring in a guest, uh, and then uh, during the pandemic, we couldn't do that. So I decided uh, and spoke with two friends in the industry, Dr. Jeff Porter, uh, who's co-teacher uh, at UCF as well. Uh, and then Mark Hotchkin, uh, a friend of mine that I'd worked with in the industry in a, in a few different stops. And so we started this podcast initially to bring great content and great people from the industry digitally into class. Uh, and then it just started uh, taking on a life of its own. And we started getting more than just our students listening and watching and requests and questions. And so we decided to just keep going. Uh, and it's been so amazing to learn what we learned and uh, and meet some of the awesome people along the way, similar to what you're doing. I'm, I'm so impressed looking at all the content that you have. It's great for you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, it's really the greatest thing. Like, as you said, like uh, also on the curiosity side, to being curious about something, you have the opportunity to ask uh, interesting people in the industry questions. And also hopefully that uh, it can be of value for, for someone who listens that can learn from industry professionals just like yourself. So I think, I think it's great. Another interest of yours that I read is uh, pickleball, something that has taken off uh, quite uh, heavily, specifically in the United States. So uh, how did this interest start? Really good question. And uh, it's somebody somewhere is going to lose or, or win a bet because the joke, at, uh, whether it be in a meeting, uh, the venue, or, or whether it be at the dinner table with my family, is how long until the topic of pickleball comes up. <laughs> <laughs> so um, with that in mind, uh, so uh, going back to, you know, Kelsey and I met uh, about three years ago, and she was a Division II college tennis player. I played tennis very competitively growing up. Uh, I had a passion for basketball and tennis. And so uh, her brother, her older brother, who also played tennis, became a pro pickleball player before it was trending to become a pro pickleball player. <laughs> so uh, we were at a holiday. It was, I believe, actually the first time I met her brother. And he challenged us to go play some pickleball. But believe it or not, my, my journey there started a little earlier. My neighbor in Orlando invited me to come play what he called at the time dash ball. What I have now learned is actually just pickleball. <laughs> it was in his backyard. But we started that about two years ago. Uh, and then we got the itch playing against her brother and being competitive tennis players. And then at the time I was living in Delray Beach, Florida, and 
from a global perspective, Delray Beach, Florida, per capita is probably one of the most talented areas from a pickleball perspective. And so uh, you have some of the top players that live in the area, Annalie Waters, James Ignanovich, the Johnsons, uh, Ava Ignanovich, James's sister. You have Millie. You have you could just go down the list of dozens of the top 25, 50 players in the world. And then you have all these aspiring pros. So going to the courts there, the level of play was so high that I was so inspired to want to play. Uh, like that. And so my passion outside of uh, a very busy full-time role uh, is traveling with Kelsey and playing pickleball with our friends. Uh, And I have to give a shout out to her because uh, she is a phenomenal pickleball athlete. She got fourth place in the Newport Beach APP tour and playing pro pro singles in her fourth pro tournament. So we're going to push her, but she also works full-time in a role, but this is just what we really enjoy to do outside of that time to stay active. Um, and stay social. And that's impressive, as you said. It's a great achievement from from Kelsey. We're excited, but it's just amazing to see uh, across the U.S. and even when I traveled to go to our uh, headquarters in, in Dusseldorf, Germany, how pickleball is taking a foothold in places all around the world. Uh, and it's just bringing people together. And I think coming out of the pandemic, uh, it really did grow through that because of the social behavioral uh, you know, I would almost call it a behavioral experiment because people were just looking for ways they could connect with others in public. And pickleball in the U.S. was something that was deemed safe to be outdoors and and, and play. And it just uh, it really took a life of its own from there. And it's something that is creating community within so many communities and bringing so many different diverse people together and something that can learn so quickly. And that's the nice thing is you don't have to be an ex tennis player. You don't have to. You can literally jump in and learn to play at a good level. And then very, even pro players can play with a good level of pickleball players and have fun. So that's what's so special about the game. Yeah, and I think uh, we have in Sweden, it was more paddle that has been the last couple of years really popular. And I think it's similar in that sense that uh, the barrier to entry is very small. So it's uh, you can you can learn it pretty quickly. And uh, of course, like when you feel like you're getting, you start and you have fun and you get better, then it's very addictive. But I haven't played pickleball. I need to admit. I was going to ask. Okay, have you played? Have you played paddle though? Yes, I've played paddle, but I, and I watched the pickleball and uh, like to see how the differences are. But I haven't actually played it myself. No. Well, we'll have to get out on a paddle court when we meet in person in Sweden at, at some point in the future. That challenge happened here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we will do for sure. You're talking about like being, you know, competitive and. Uh, when you play, do you play with your uh, fiance or against, or does it, is, does it get very competitive there? <laughs> we are very competitive uh, with others and with each other. So we, I'll put it this way: we are now forever practice partners and and, and training partners. Uh, so we play in fun tournaments and and money ball type tournaments together. Uh, but we've decided for probably the uh, long term health and, and and safety of our relationship not to play professionally together. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we uh we play with others and she is a better female pickleball player than I'm a male pickleball player but I I am still very competitive. So I'll probably be playing my first pro tournament uh in the near future. Oh, that's exciting. It is. But yeah, to answer your question, so we 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 play together, we play against each other. Uh I'd say at least a couple times a week and our singles matches uh can can be a dinner table conversation, that's for sure. <laughs> I understand that. So, you know, pickleball at large, do you think that it has long-term potential to grow over time or, you know, with paddle in Sweden, for example, it had a huge increase and now it has slowed down a little bit. So how how do you see the potential for pickleball over time in the United States? So I do believe there's a long-term place for pickleball and paddle. I think that racket sports as a whole, they're going to work together and it's going to be a future of racket sports that uh, have communities that like little sub communities, but then a bigger community that that interacts together. And so what that looks like into the future, I'm not completely sure. I think there's going to be a lot of pivots and a, and a lot of changes, but based on who's all jumped in and based on the fast success, even from a media and TV perspective that that is currently happening, I do believe it's here to stay. And I think it's just a matter of how that will take shape and what life. And you know, we were talking about actually uh, at the gym very early this morning, a conversation about you know the difference between tennis and some of the other sports where it's tournaments 
And now in pickleball, you have tournaments, but you also have league play with team play. And, you know, what does the future of that look like? And are the stories compelling? And and right now they are, but are they compelling enough for the long term? And I'm biased because I love the sport. So I think so. But from an unbiased perspective, I think um, it's going to be how many people continue to join in because I, I really believe from a casual play perspective, that's how you build fans, right? If we look at other sports that are seeing challenges, uh, I'll give the example of, say, race car driving. It's such a cool sport. It's so amazing. And F1 is is one of the most premier sports in the world. But we're moving into a future where young people may not even have a license or drive. And so are, is their affinity towards cars going to be the same as the generation prior? Those are the questions we have to look at. It's how do we build the emotional relationship with the content that's happening in the competition? I haven't thought about that, like with the autonomous cars and all of that and how that would affect the Formula One and motorsports. That's an interesting one. Uber Ferraris around the corner. I mean, it's going to be expensive, but <laughs> it'll be an autonomous Ferrari that comes and picks you up. But at least you can have two people in it and... You know, no one has to drive, so it'd be fun. That's true. <laughs> That's a good one. I like that. We mentioned COVID and some other things, but has there been any other bumps on the road in your career? And if so, how have you overcome them? If anyone says there hasn't been bumps in their career or along the road, then they've either been very lucky or they're a very good storyteller. <laughs> but with that said... Uh, of course, there's been bumps, and and I've learned so much along the way through failing, failing forward. Um, I think you know personally, the skill sets I've developed by failing. Uh, and I'll give the example. It's it's just in how you work and collaborate with others, right? Early on in my career, I believe you're so excited, you just want to push, and you think you know so much. Whereas then, when you fail, you learn that you still have so much out there to learn. And you're more open to listening and and and, and working collaboratively with others and um, bringing in diverse skill sets. Uh, so personally, I'd say I've learned so many more skill sets through my career by failing personally at whether it be projects, whether it be communication, whether it be relationships. Uh, but the point is learning, then improving, and then and then getting better. Um, from a professional standpoint, uh, from a uh, career aspect. Of course, there's been projects or a customer or, or, or things that, that didn't go as planned. Uh, but again, the, the key focus is, is learning and fine-tuning and growing and taking that forward. Um, from a business perspective, I've been very lucky um, in the sense that a lot of business I've been working with are growing. <laughs> and so, But you know, in owning my own business and working with a business partner, we both learned a lot about ourselves, about the business. And you know, we were lucky in the sense that we parted uh, and, and got opportunities uh, in both of our lives to to move on towards other things, not necessarily at the end because we weren't um, working with customers, but we had different goals that we wanted to pursue. But still in owning your own business, I learned so much more about not only is it about creating an awesome product and, and working within that product on a daily basis, but it's also about creating a culture internally and managing people and managing uh, goals and objectives and managing payroll, managing accounting, managing taxes, you know, there's so much that you learn uh, by failing in different areas and, and and moving forward. Definitely. And you mentioned luck there a couple of times, and I'm of the opinion that to some extent we create our luck. So, you know, you are saying you're curious, you're hardworking. So of course that also contributes and that some companies were performing well when you were in them maybe part of it was because your contribution there so i think that uh, luck also it's uh, but it's also you know your contributions to it marcus i believe there's a formula in some regards to luck and it's where a positive attitude preparation and hard work meet opportunity it doesn't mean that that that, that luck isn't going to happen all the time that's why it's luck but without those four other things luck isn't going to come by as often Definitely. I love that. So um, I'd like to end with a networking question. So who from your network do you think would be a good guest on this podcast? That is a very good question. So I think from sponsorships, yes. Actually, I've been very impressed with their growth. And I uh, met Jason Smith uh, actually early on in my podcasting journey. He was actually at the time working 
uh, full time for a, a credit union managing all their sponsorships. And he started building the technology with a business partner and building the idea and the vision of the business. And now he has uh, left what was his full time role and is working full time in this business. It's grown since that. And just I've been cheering them along ever since. And um, seeing that has been so impressive. And so I would love for you to interview him because I'd love to listen to what we talked about dated many years ago and then fast forward and hear all of the uh, developments and, and what he's learned today. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Keel, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Sports Management Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Marcus. This has been a lot of fun and, and great to meet you. Thank you for listening to the Sports Management Podcast. Please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment about what you thought about this episode. If you want to get in contact with me, send an email to sportsmpodcast at gmail.com or hit me up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at sportsmpodcast.